Uh, welcome everyone to session seven, We're moving from data centers to internet scale services in this session, uh, four excellent papers. Uh, the first paper is Anycast in Context, a tale of two systems. And the presenter is going to be Thomas Koch, who is a third year electrical engineering PhD candidate studying with Ethan Katz Bassett at Columbia University. His interests include content delivery and internet measurement methods with a focus on practical content delivery optimizations. Uh, let's start the video. In the literature, we see some mixed reviews of Anycast. Quoted here are two papers from major conferences within a few years of each other that arrive at two very different conclusions. One study says Anycast's inefficiencies are surprisingly excessive, while the other says Anycast performs well despite the lack of centralized control. So naturally, we were confused. We went ahead and cleared up the confusion by analyzing two systems that use Anycast using both the same methodology and coverage so we could compare results. When we placed Anycast performance in the context of the system, we realized that Anycast performance can be quite good when it matters to users. Anycast is used by many systems on the internet, each of which have different goals and system designs. Deployments are also growing. Both Microsoft and the root DNS have more than doubled in size in the past five years. These deployments also host some of the most latency sensitive services there are. Google Cloud VMs can host game engines, which have strict latency requirements. Now, recall that some papers had mixed reviews about Anycast. We noticed that they evaluated different types of deployments, so it's difficult to compare results. So why are there different takeaways about Anycast performance? In particular, do the deployments have anything to do with it? To answer these questions, we make the following contributions. First, we find that the root DNS specifically has poor Anycast performance, but Anycast performs well for Microsoft. Second, we show that root DNS performance hardly matters to users, since caching of root DNS records is so effective. On the other hand, performance is quite important in Microsoft CDN, since users frequently traverse paths to Microsoft. Finally, we provide evidence that Microsoft keeps performance good by peering closely with end user networks, which shortens paths between users and content. We've been a little high level, so let's dive into the details. IP Anycast is an approach to routing where servers, which we call sites, all use the same IP address and serve the same content. The set of sites is called a deployment. In this figure, you can see a deployment with three sites in three distinct locations, all advertising the same prefix. And they're connected to a network of users by way of ASs A through D. Not only can the network of users reach three different sites to get the same content, but the network of users also has many paths to each of these three sites, given its connectivity to other ASs. The route from the network to the site is selected via BGP, which takes into account properties such as local preference and AS path length. In this example, users reach site two through ASB. Anycast provides many benefits, including scalability, handling of failure, and DDoS protection. So is Anycast all good? Not quite. Since BGP doesn't take performance into account when making decisions about which routes to select, users may take unnecessarily high latency paths. This phenomenon is called inflation. Users here reach site two in 60 milliseconds, but the path to site three is 20 milliseconds. So these users would benefit from instead reaching site three. So how do we measure this inflation? In this talk, we're gonna talk about latency inflation. We also measure geographic inflation, which you can read more about in the paper. To calculate la latency inflation, we compute the achieved latency minus a reasonable lowest alternative latency. We say the reasonable lowest latency is one and a half times the great circle distance converted to the speed of light and fiber. We selected this lower bound for technical reasons, which you can read more about in the paper. Let's look at an example. Recall that the set of users goes through ASB to reach site two. Users reach site two in 60 milliseconds and the closest site is 1200 kilometers. The reasonable lowest alternative latency is therefore nine milliseconds. And so the latency inflation is 51 milliseconds. Let's discuss the two systems, the root DNS and Microsoft CDN. First, what's the root DNS? It all starts with a user. The user wants to resolve a human readable name like sitcom.org to the IP address where sitcom.org can be found. The user asks the recursive resolver about sitcom.org and the recursive resolver will query the root DNS asking about the top level domain or TLD for short. The root DNS is a group of 13 Anycast deployments referred to by letters of the alphabet run by different organizations. The deployments are anywhere from six to 250 sites. The recursive resolver can choose whichever root letter it wants to query since each letter deployment provides an identical service. In this case, the recursive resolver asks B root where it can find org since the user is asking about sitcom.org. 
The recursive resolver stores the answer from broot in its cache. Nearly all records from the root servers have a TTL, which is a time to live, of two days, which means the recursive resolver can store that record for up to two days before it needs to refresh it. The recursive then completes the resolution process and forwards the results to the user. Usually, these recursive resolvers, and therefore their caches, are shared among users in an ISP. So the chance that a user has to wait for a root DNS query is very small, since there's ideally one query per TLD every two days among the entire set of users. We use concurrent packet captures for two days from nearly all root letters, which tell us who's querying the root DNS, how often they query, and which sites they're hitting. From TCP DNS queries, we can extract latency from recursive resolvers to sites, which we use to calculate latency and inflation. Measurements come from queriers in more than 50,000 ASs. Microsoft operates an Anycast CDN with 110 sites, which we call R110. Microsoft also has smaller sub-deployments that we discuss in the paper, but we focus on the largest one here. We obtain user counts from Microsoft who approximates user counts by counting distinct IP addresses. Server-side logs and client-side measurements give us latency measurements from users to sites. Microsoft measurements are also for more than 50,000 ASs. Now that we have sufficient background, let's jump into some results. First, our results on inflation. The x-axis here shows latency inflation, and the y-axis shows the cumulative fraction of users. For example, the point at 50, 0.5 means that 50% of users experience at most 50 milliseconds of latency inflation. The blue axis show latency inflation for Microsoft's deployment, and the red marker shows C-roots inflation as an example of an individual roots inflation, which is similar to other root letters. For root letters, inflation is quite large, much larger than in Microsoft CDN. For example, the red circles show that 65% of users experience less than 100 milliseconds of latency inflation to C-root, but 98% of users experience less than 100 milliseconds to Microsoft. So is large inflation in the root DNS a problem? That is, does the inflation impact users? For the root DNS, one might think, no, it doesn't really, due to the caching of DNS records we mentioned. That being said, there's a lot of attention being placed on root DNS latency. In addition to the 2018 SIGCOM paper we mentioned earlier, here are news posts, some of which are from reputable sources such as Thousand Eyes. Given all this attention on root DNS latency, we felt it was necessary to measure inflation's impact on users, despite our ability to reason intuitively about root DNS interactions. So to measure this impact, we looked at how users interact with the root DNS. We calculate the number of queries each user makes each day by counting the number of queries seen in our root DNS traces by recursives and divide daily query counts by the number of users seen using that recursive. The numerator in the equation is the number of queries made by a recursive, while the denominator is the number of users using that recursive. The figure shows queries per user per day on the x-axis and the cumulative fraction of users on the y-axis. For example, the point at 0.1,0.2 circled in red means that 20% of users experience at most 0.1 queries to the root DNS on average. At the median, users execute about a query a day to the root DNS, and that's out of all the other things you're doing on the internet. If we're only querying it once per day, any cast could route our queries to the root DNS around the globe, and we wouldn't notice a difference. It would hardly affect our internet experience. So root DNS latency hardly matters to users. In Microsoft CDN, we show latency really does matter. Unlike in the root DNS, where a round trip is rarely incurred, we measured users incur at least 10 round trips when fetching Microsoft web pages. To obtain a lower bound on how much latency matters in a web page load, for example, we multiply latency per round trip by the lower bound on the number of round trips, which is 10. The figure shows a CDF of latency per round trip for users on the top axis and latency per web page load on the bottom axis. For example, the red circle indicates that 65% of users experience at most 20 milliseconds per round trip, or equivalently, roughly 200 milliseconds per page load. Latency for users is low, but inflation could hurt users significantly since the inflation is compounded with each round trip. Recall that median latency in CRUD, for example, was 50 milliseconds. Adding CRUD's inflation at the median would drastically increase page load times by at least 500 milliseconds. Therefore, Microsoft has a much larger incentive than root DNS operators to limit inflation for users. So why is inflation so different? To answer this, we looked at paths to Microsoft in the roots and found that AS paths to Microsoft are shorter. The left plot shows a bar graph of AS path lengths to each destination from ripe Atlas probes. For example, 63% of paths to Microsoft are direct connections, but only 15% of paths to the root DNS are direct connections, as highlighted by the red circles. The right plot shows that shorter AS paths have less inflation, so it seems that short paths on the left are helping Microsoft control inflation. 
To obtain the right plot, we plot the inflation right atlas probes experienced in a box and whisker sorted by the AS path length to each destination. For example, the CDN and all roots whisker show that paths of length two have less inflation than paths of length three and four. The trend is not absolute across all route layers, likely since deployment and routing strategies play roles as well. So why are paths to Microsoft shorter? And why do shorter paths have less inflation? Well, Microsoft directly connects to networks, sidestepping the challenges of BGP. That is, BGP does not take performance into account. Direct paths through peers and shorter AS paths are preferred in the BGP decision process, and so Microsoft can more directly optimize for performance. Optimizing BGP advertisements to reduce inflation and pairing with end user networks to shorten AS paths takes a lot of time and money. This expense doesn't really make sense for routes since inflation, since latency hardly matters. Let's compare three different Anycast deployments, Microsoft, Akamai, and the RootDNS. Although we don't discuss Akamai DNS in our paper, we feel it's important to compare since there's a talk about it soon, and there are key differences. Let's look at the first three columns. Akamai assigns IP addresses to sites to optimize performance and promote resilience, with only 25 out of hundreds of sites given one IP address. The distinguishing factor between Microsoft's Anycast deployments, which we talk more about in the paper, is regulatory, and so the prefix to site assignments are related to the applications each site hosts. The root DNS assigns prefixes to sites by root letter, and all sites in a root letter advertise the same prefix. These services have different connectivity. Microsoft has multiple transit providers per site and peers with hundreds of end-user networks. Akamai has one transit provider per site and between 1 and 15 peers. Root DNS connectivity varies among root letters. The talk about Akamai DNS coming up soon presents AnyOpt, an Anycast optimization framework. Unfortunately, since Microsoft has lots of peers and so many sites, it's unlikely any opt can be applied to CDN such as Microsoft. But we're excited that Anycast deployment optimization is an active area of research, and we're looking forward to their talk. The three services serve content with different latency requirements, which we approximate with round trips for content fetch. Users fetching Microsoft content incur at least 10 round trips, so inflation really hurts. Query stock on my DNS occur more often than in the root DNS since they host more DNS records and have shorter TTLs. But caching and small content size still implies users probably will incur, on average, less than a round trip when fetching content. Queries to the root DNS rarely occur due to caching. Because of all these differences, the three deployments optimize performance in different ways, which we summarize in the final column, optimization strategy. Microsoft invests in peering, optimizes route announcements, and leverages its global WAN. Akamai uses intricate optimization algorithms that assign certain prefixes to certain sites. Recursive resolvers rely on caching to deliver performance benefits to users in the root DNS. Recall that we began this investigation because of prior work that assessed Anycast out of the context of its deployment, the root DNS. So our major conclusion is that Anycast must be assessed in context, and we must understand how that context can shape performance. In particular, root DNS latency hardly matters to users, so we should stop focusing on it and deploying to reduce it. Moreover, inflation can be a misleading metric, since absolute latency is more important. And any cast deployments can be engineered to keep latency low, despite the presence of some inflation. Thank you. That was a great talk. I'm still waiting for questions on Slack. Yeah, so there is a question from Nitinder Mohan. Hi Nitinder. Um, this, uh, hi Nitinder from TU Munich here. Great talk. I'm curious about your result on number of AS from Ripe Atlas in slide 21. Do you think this result can be influenced by deployment characteristics of Ripe Atlas probes, which are usually in more managed locations? Did you, did you look into if your peering results remain unchanged if you use probes in ISP networks? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we did not look into uh, limiting the set of probes to be a particular um, you know, set. Uh, we did keep them constant across all destinations. Uh, we used Ripe Atlas probes uh, because we needed trace routes. And you know, that's a platform which you can get trace routes. And we also needed historical data uh, because we were using an older uh, set of root DNS captures from a couple of years ago. And uh, Ripe Atlas has historical data to the root servers, which is very nice. Okay. Um, I myself had one question. So my question is, uh, 
now that you've done this study, what would it take to create a tool or a framework that can make it easy to assess performance of other Anycast systems, um, hopefully on a recurring basis? Do you have any thoughts? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I do know that, uh, you know, deployments, so, so Microsoft does look at performance um, and, you know, it looks for changes in performance that are unexpected and it has, you know, recurring monitoring tools. Um, you know, it has the set of locations of its deployments and locations of its users and it sees spikes, it knows something's wrong. Um, uh, I can't comment on what other deployments have, uh, but I, suppose that the details of like such systems that would monitor performance and act on it would depend greatly on the deployment. Uh, and that's one point we try to make in our paper is that, you know, the, the, um, what you need in a deployment depends a lot on how in users interact with that deployment. Right. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and we there is one more question on the Slack, but in the interest of time, we're going to move to the next presentation. So the next talk is titled XLink QOE Driven Multipath Quick Transport in Large Scale Video Services. This is from Alibaba and the speaker is Yunfai Ma, uh, who, is a current, who is currently a lead researcher slash staff engineer at XG Lab in Alibaba demo academy and he is responsible for building the next generation mobile transport protocols and algorithms before joining alibaba he was a postdoctoral researcher at mit media lab he received phd in ece from cornell university and bs from uctc sorry usdc in recent years he has published more than 10 papers on top cs conferences including sitcom mobicom and nsdi and holds more than 15 granted US patents. His research has been covered by media outlets, including BBC, Verge, MIT Technology Review, CBS Morning, CBS Morning and IEEE Spectrum. Uh, let's roll the video. Hello, everyone. My name is Yunfei Ma, and I'm from the XG Lab at Alibaba Dhamma Academy. Today, my great pleasure to give this talk at CCOM 21. The title of this talk is XLink, QE Driven Multipass Quick. This work is a joint collaboration between Alibaba Dhamma Academy, Alibaba Tower Technology, and the Chinese Academy of Science. This work cannot be done without my wonderful collaborators, so I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge all my co-authors, including Zhi Longzheng, Harry Liu, and Ming Zhang from Alibaba Dhamma Academy, Yan Mei Liu, Yuan Bo Zhang, Jiu Hai Zhang, Wei Shi, Wen Tao Chen, Ying Li, and Hai Hong from Taobao Technology, Fu Yang and Zhen Yuli from ICT CAS, and Ching An from Alibaba Technology Standardization Group. XLink is driven by the ever-growing needs of customers on video quality. Unfortunately, today, when we want to deliver the superior experience to our users, we are forced to deal with poor last mile connectivity problems such as video slow start, lost connections, and high video recovery rate. One big opportunity to fundamentally address the poor network connectivity problem is multipass transport protocol, as today, most of the smart devices are equipped with many video interfaces like Wi-Fi and cellular. Therefore, if we can have a lightweight multipass transport protocol that can be easily used by our apps, we can aggregate independent links for more bandwidth and enhance network robustness for our applications. The first multipass draft was proposed by Christian Huitema in 1995, but it was not until 2013 that MPTCP became RFC. Now Apple used MPTCP for Siri and music, Huawei also introduced Link Turbo, but overall, the adoption of multipass over the public internet is slow. Moreover, current large deployments such as Siri and Apple Music are all audio apps, and there is no large scale deployments of video services using multipass. So, in this work, we try to answer the following question Is it worthwhile to bring multipass to large scale video services? Different from generic web traffic and audio apps like Siri and Apple Music, large-scale video services is particularly challenging. The first thing is that video apps are performance sensitive in terms of bandwidth, latency, and recovery rate. The second thing is that video application is traffic cost sensitive. We have to ensure that we can not only meet the performance requirements, but also doing so with minimizing traffic cost cost overhead. 
since video is going to make 80% of the total internet traffic, even a slight increase in the traffic cost overhead can cost a lot of money. To understand what's wrong with MPTCP in large-scale video services, there are several issues. The first one is the deployment difficulty. MPTCP requires kernel support from client and server. It means that for app service provider, they cannot enable multipass with just a new app release. And it is really a big challenge to enable this feature on smartphones that they have no control. On the other hand, for phone manufacturers, even though they have more control of the smartphone OS, they have no control of the server end. As a result, there is a deadlock and enabling MPTCP from one end to the other is not easy. The second issue is how to design the right scheduling algorithm for multipass. In order to send traffic on multiple passes, a scheduler is needed to split the traffic. However, different video applications require different QoS support. For example, in long video, video rebuffer rate is very critical. In short video, in addition to the rebuffer rate, you also need to think about the startup speed because users are less patient with slow start in short videos. Therefore, it is desired that the scheduler is highly customized for each app. But MPTCP is in the kernel, so designing a scheduling algorithm that can fit all of the different needs becomes extremely difficult. Multipass Quick offers several key advantages over MPTCP. The figure on the left shows network stack. At the top, we have application protocols such as HTTP3, RTMP, and RPC. They utilize Quick as a transport layer. One layer below, we implement the multipass extension of Quick, which includes pass management, scheduler, loss detection, and recovery modules. All these components are integrated with the app. Multipass Quick use UDP socket to send and receive packets on different network interfaces like Wi-Fi, cellular, and Ethernet, so kernel changes are not necessary. The user space nature of Quick makes the deployment much easier than MPTCP, which can be done as simple as an app release. More importantly, because Multipass Quick is integrated with the app, this allows us to design highly customized algorithms to cater for the needs of different applications. Unfortunately, the problem with multipass is that obtaining good multipass transport performance is not as straightforward as one might expect. The first thing we did was an A-B test between vanilla multipass quick and the single pass quick. The vanilla multipass quick uses the main RTT scheduler, which was a default MPTCP scheduler in Linux kernel, and also the scheduler used in the MP quick Cornex 17 paper. The figure on the right shows the video request completion time of one megabyte video chunks. We plot the median 95th percentile and 99th percentile video chunk request completion time collected throughout one week. Even though one might expect there is an immediate performance gain from deploying multipass, multipass in fact gave worse performance, especially at the tail. Vanilla MP always lead to degraded 99th percentile RCT, which could be even 28% worse than that of the single pass quick. But in order to justify the incentive of using multipass, multipass should achieve no worse performance. So how can we solve this problem? It turns out that the major problem was the head of line blocking. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. As shown in this figure, the pass RTT difference could be very large in wireless when the scheduler splits packets across, across two passes. The packets sent earlier could end up arriving later, causing a blocking effect as the other packets cannot be submitted to the application layer, thus dragging down the overall performance. In other words, due to the multipass head of line blocking, it is the slow pass that determines the overall performance. To overcome multipass head of line blocking, one way is to send duplicate packets, as shown in this figure. But redundant packets also mean that the bandwidth or traffic cost is much higher, especially in video application. The amount of traffic is already very high. For example, today, one gigabyte traffic could cost as much as 10 cents. Indeed, over the past few years, there has been a lot of research interest on the multipass scheduling from the research community, but when we put them into this coordinate, they generally fall into two categories. The first category is along the x-axis, where the performance is high, but the traffic cost overhead is also high, which makes them difficult to deploy in large-scale video services. The second category is along the y-axis, the traffic cost overhead is low, which is good for large-scale deployment, but the performance is also low. So what we really need is a solution at the top right corner, which can achieve good performance and low cost at the same time. Basically, we have two design goals. The first one is optimal user perceived quality of experience. The second one is minimize cost overhead. To dive deeper into this, these problems, if you ask who knows the performance best, the answer is a video player, because the video player would know exactly if a video rebuffers. On the other hand, 
the cost is determined directly by our scheduling algorithm on the server. So in order to optimize performance and the cost at the same time, we really need the player to work with the scheduler remotely. To enable the remote collaboration between the scheduler and the video player in Xlink, we introduced the QE-driven multipath scheduling, which is the first multipath scheduler based on remote feedback control. And now let me explain to you how Xlink's QE-driven scheduling works. In video streaming, the server sends out traffic on multiple passes. This data are acknowledged via the ACKMP frame. But when sending out the ACKMP frame, the Xlink's client will request the video player's QE info which allows the server to compute the playtime left in the video player. Then Xlink attaches the QE info in the QE control signal field of the ACKMP frame and send it back to the server. After receiving the ACKMP frame, the server then passes the QE control signal to its multipath scheduler. The scheduler uses the feedback to control the level of packet reinjection. So the high level idea is that when the video player's buffer level is low, we need to ensure high performance maybe at the cost of more redundant traffic, but when the video player's buffer level is high, we can act more conservatively, avoiding unnecessary redundant traffic cost. Why we use reinjection? Reinjection is used to decouple multiple passes. As discussed earlier, the root cause of multi-pass head online blocking is a coupling of multiple passes when the scheduler splits packets. As shown in this figure, if packets six and seven on the slow pass are lost, it will take a long time to recover the and the stream is blocked. With reinjection, when the send queue has no data to send, the scheduler will check the unacted queue and reinject unacted packets directly into the fast pass. This allows the receiver to receive packets six and seven much, much earlier before they can be recovered from the slow pass. Here, we illustrate how QE control functions. In the figure on the left, there are two network traces of two different passes. The throughput was stable in pass two, but the throughput varied a lot in pass one and fell down to zero between the second and the fourth second. We first show how client's video buffer level varied during the time without reinjection. The buffer level fell to almost zero when the throughput of pass two fell to zero, causing a video rebuffer. And this is due to the MP head of line blocking we discussed earlier. When we use reinjection without QE feedback, Although the buffer level of the video player raised continuously and was very safe after the fourth second, the sender still kept reinjecting on acknowledged packets and the reinjection bytes continued to increase, causing unnecessary traffic cost. Here is the effect when QE control was enabled to control the reinjection process. In this figure on the right, reinjection was applied at the beginning to accelerate the video startup. When the first pass degraded, reinjection was turned on to ensure that the buffer level was safe. When the buffer level of the video player was safe enough, the sender stopped reinjecting, so unnecessary traffic was avoided, saving cost. This allows us to achieve performance and cost efficiency at the same time. In our large-scale deployment, we saw a traffic redundancy reduction from 15% to 2% with the QE control mechanism. We perform a large-scale A-B test in Taobao Mobile to verify the effectiveness of X-Link on the experimental method, we formed two contrast groups running in parallel with 100k participants who upgraded to Taobao mobile test versions. The data set consists of over 3 million video plays. Regarding the implementation, we integrate Xlink with Taobao mobile Android app on the client side. On the server side, we deploy Xlink on our edge servers. Both client and server use the XQuick library, which is the Alibaba IETF quick library. The Xlink protocol is designed based on our IETF draft, and the link is shown in the left corner. Here is a demo of how Xlink works in Taobao short video. The Xlink that uses Wi Fi and LTE is on the left. On the right side is the single pass quick with Wi Fi. As you can see, Xlink starts much quicker, and also because of the unstable Wi Fi connection, the single pass quick suffers from a very strong rebuffering. While the LTE with LTE and Wi Fi running in parallel, Xlink's playback is very smooth throughout the whole process. In the A-B test of the QE-driven scheduling, we collected data throughout a period of two weeks. In contrast to vanilla MP, Xlink outperformed single pass consistently. Again, the horizontal axis is days, on the y-axis we plot the median 95th percentile and the 99th percentile of the video request completion time. We got a 9.4% to 34% improvement in the 95th percentile and a 19% to 50% improvement in the 99th percentile RCT. Here we show how multipass changes the video rebuffer rate versus single pass. 
the result of vanilla multipass is shown in the upper table, while the result of x fink is shown in the lower table. A negative number indicated that the rebuffer rate of vanilla MP was worse than that of the single pass click. For vanilla MP, instead of decreasing, it increased more than 34%, with the largest increase up to 96%. Such a result was not surprising due to the issues discussed before. Vanilla MP failed to meet the criteria of achieving no worse performance than single pass click transport. In contrast to single pass click, Xlink consistently outperformed single pass click in video rebuff rate. The observed rebuff rate reduction was significant, which ranged from 24% to 67%. The evaluation results showed that Xlink was effective in improving the quality of user perceived experience in terms of video playback smoothness. Finally, we show the effect of first video frame acceleration by enabling and disabling this functionality in Xlink during the experiment. The improvement of first video frame latency over single pass click at different percentiles are plotted here. Without first video frame acceleration, the video latency became much worse than that of the single pass click, where the 99th percentile latency was even 14% slower. Such a degradation was caused by the excess of delay introduced by the slow pass. In contrast, the first video frame acceleration avoided this excessive delay and offered a much faster video startup. The 99th percentile improvement was more than 32% than that of the single pass. The evaluation results showed that Xlink was effective in improving the quality of user perceived experience in terms of video startup speed. To conclude, we present Xlink, the first QE driven multipass transport in implemented as a lightweight extension over Quick. With Xlink, we prove the feasibility, deployability, and benefits of multipass quick in large-scale video services. We believe that such a QE-driven approach extends beyond short videos and pave ways for other types of video services, such as long-form VOD, live streaming, AR, and VR. With that, I would like to conclude my talk, and thanks so much for your attention. Thanks so much. That was a great talk. Uh, I do see a couple of questions on on the Slack channel. Let's start with the first one. The question is from Anna Grunstrom. Great talk. You use application knowledge to aid multipath scheduling and path management. Could you comment on what parts of your solution are specific to video and what parts generalize to other applications? Okay, uh, thanks so much uh, for the great question. Uh, I think for uh, our current implementation, we're tailored for the video application because uh, we think uh, video is going to make 80% of the total internet traffic. And also ensuring uh, good uh, quality of experience for video, uh, for example, uh, is not easy, an easy task because uh, nowadays if you uh, look into a cell phone, there are so many uh, video applications and all these video applications, they really have uh, different QE requirement. For example, for short videos, you need a very fast uh, startup speed. And also uh, for web conferencing, you really need to ensure a uh, very, very low latency. And those uh, requirements is not easy to satisfy with a uh, just a, a simple uh, scheduling algorithm. So uh, one uh, big opportunity of Quick, so we think is that the Quick is a user space protocol. So it allows you to design highly customized algorithm uh, to cater for your needs. So in this case, so what we're trying to do is uh, for videos, we uh, uh, work on Xlink, which features uh, remote collaboration between the uh, client and server. And it also helps us to improve the performance of video. And, and for uh, general, general web, web traffic, uh, it really depends on your need. For example, if you are just want to download a file, and maybe, uh, so this QE is not uh, that critical or all you want to do is you want to uh, optimize your, uh, for example, uh, link aggregation rates or, or the throughput, uh, you can use some alg uh, scheduling algorithms such as ECF. Okay, thanks. Um, there are quite a few more questions. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm going to move on to the third talk, but I'll encourage you to check the Slack channel and um, okay, try sure. to answer those questions. Thanks again. Thanks so much. Let's move on to the third talk. The third talk is the ties that unbind decoupling IP from web services and sockets for robust 
addressing agility at CDN scale. The speaker is going to be Marvan Fayed, who is a manager and research lead at Cloudflare in Inc. and a visiting professor at the University of St. Andrews, UK, where he was an associate professor before joining Cloudflare's recently launched research division. Alongside Marvin is a senior member of both IEEE and ACM, as well as co-founder and former director of an award-winning cooperative internet backhaul provider, Hubs CIC. Uh, all yours, Marvin. Let's roll the video. Hello, and welcome to the Ties That Unbind. My name is Marwan Fayed, and I'm here to talk about work to decouple IP from the service names and sockets with which they're commonly associated at CDN scale in order to achieve something we're calling addressing agility. This work, of course, is in collaboration with many people at Cloudflare, as well as a few familiar names at Virginia Tech, Maryland, and Northeastern. Let's first begin by trying to define addressing agility. We think of addressing agility as being the ability to reuse or reassign or reallocate IP addresses in a manner that is isolated and independent from the names and the processes to which they're commonly bound. And I'd like to actually begin by sharing some of the lessons that we learned in the end. Namely, one of them, how many names can we associate with a single IP address? I can confidently say no fewer than 20 plus million. Second thing we've learned is that when we want to change addresses, the rate at which we can change them is as fast as per DNS query. And lastly, when we want to change them, we can do so for any reason. This is to reflect policies instead of name changes. And in the end, this opens up an interesting question, which is what new systems and features do these observations enable? And I'll just touch upon those at the end. But why do we need addressing agility at all? It turns out that at scale, address bindings actually become a bottleneck and they get in the way of being able to respond, adapt, be flexible, and actually impede innovation. This is in part a, a, a consequence of 40 years of legacy that started with one name, one machine, and one or maybe a few IP addresses. And as a result, we have something that I've chosen to represent intentionally with a narrow waist which is this idea that host names are often associated with IP addresses bound, and similarly IP addresses to interfaces and sockets. Now on the surface, this doesn't sound like a terrible thing, except that when you want to make changes at scale, there's this transitive relationship that emerges where even making changes on one, on one layer at the upper layers might have an impact at the lower layers. So as a consequence, any system changes or re-architecting new things costs time and money. Well, the default response, of course, is more addresses. If we restrict ourselves to IPv4, we can see the number of IP addresses associated with a set of CDNs is absolutely staggering. And even more so if we assign the current market value. So I'm here to say, make the claim, more addresses is the wrong solution. If we think about it in IPv4, the scarcity of IP4 addresses increases their cost, but it also locks out new entrants into the domain. IPv6 is great, except that there's so many addresses that it's just far too easy to lose count. From a CDN's perspective, addresses are resources. And we in the engineering and science community would say more of any resources, just brute force thinking. Resources should be scheduled, and this is the position we're taking about IP addresses as well. So let's look at this, come back to this observation. How do we get out of here? And it turns out actually some of the enabling technologies already take us in the right direction, namely name-based virtual hosting in the higher layers with SNI or HTTP host, and IP-based virtual hosting with ECMP and consistent hashing-like mechanisms in lower layers. So let's talk a little bit about the design. Fundamentally, the purpose of this is to return or reduce, I suppose, IP addresses to their original intended purpose, if you look at the original RFCs, of reachability. And we're going to do so in two ways. At higher layers, we're going to re-architect DNS, and at lower layers, we're going to re-architect sockets to be programmable. And I want to point out here that each of these can be deployed independently, conferring uh, uh, rightful benefits within their respective space. 
So here's the current view of authoritative DNS on names. A query comes in, we do the lookup on the name, and get a bunch of addresses that are matched to that name. Maybe some administ additional administrative work, and then construct the record and send it back. So this begs the question, if we're going to change the name bindings, where do they actually live? It's not in a lookup table or a database somewhere, as far as the internet is concerned. The bindings actually appear only when a DNS query comes in and a response is sent back. And interestingly, they last only as long as the response sits in a downstream DNS cache, or there's an open connection using that binding. So instead, we're going to re-architect authoritative DNS and ignore the name completely. And instead, when a query arrives, we just apply some policy. In, for the purpose of this talk, we say, is it arriving in a particular location? Does it sit within a particular account type? And if so, generate a random bit string and attend it to, uh, append it to a particular prefix. At the lower layers, the Socket API is 40 years old. There's lots of great work happening in the community to address its shortcomings. But for this instance, it's enough to say that sockets are too rigid, they're highly unscalable, and they're very much all or nothing. So instead, we've used BPF to architect something called socket lookups, or SK lookups. And the idea is simple. A packet comes in a particular IP port pair. We look up in a, in a dynamically populated mapping table which sockets those, IP, those packets should be forwarded to. And in a sense, this allows us to carve up the IP port pair space in a way that suits. If you want to try this, it's actually been accepted into the mainline Linux kernel from version 5.9. One of the reviewer's comments asked about transferability. Does this apply to other domains as well? Who exactly can make use of this? It's a very simple definition. If you happen to run a network that has ownership or a service, ownership of authoritative DNS, then you can do the DNS side, which is the name to the IP address binding. And that confers the benefits of policy addressing and some agility. Randomization requires very small source code changes as we know from experience, but the engine to enable a wider set of policies and how to express them is future work. On the connection termination side, if you have ownership of that, well, you get socket adaptation and flexibility and responsiveness and conservation, the ability to split up IP port pair space in a way that suits you. Again, this is available publicly now if you want to try it. And we're leaving for future work the systems that remap these IP port pairs for running processes, but measurements are available as well. So just pause here for a moment and say, these are applicable not just to large CDNs, but also to universities and enterprise, anyone that has ownership over either or both of these. So let's talk a little bit about the deployment and the evaluation. How do we know this is true? Well, first I would like to set expectations and point out the goals and measures of success. If this works, we should have forced no changes on surrounding systems. We should see no observable changes in behavior both inside the system or outside in the wider internet. We should see no performance degradation and fundamentally nothing should break. So to give you a sense of the size of, of the Cloudflare network, there are pops and data centers in, in 200 plus cities in more than 100 countries. We're going to isolate ourselves to this region up here with six pops taking multiple time zones, the whole of Canada, and we're responding to 100% of all DNS queries for 20 plus million host names that meet the policy objective. The space that we are, are working within, a single slash 20 in IPv4 and a slash 44 in IPv6, everything I talk about in one domain works in the other. The duration of this, if only to give you confidence that this works, from June 2020, IP randomization has been in effect. And then in June 2021, we decided to move to one single IP address for all 20 plus host names, 20 million plus host names, in order to allay any doubts and fears. This is at one single pop, by the way, just to be a little careful. So when it comes to measuring and evaluating performance, very much the response is there's nothing to see here. And this responds to the reviewer's second main comment about evaluation. Whenever we looked at the before and the after, they were indistinguishable. So let's first share a little bit about the Cloudflare architecture. Every data center at Cloudflare is architected to be the same. 
as is every server within the data center. And this is to uh, make management simple. Okay? So when a service runs on one machine, it runs on all the machines. Interestingly, no changes to surrounding systems. So the denial of service, the layer four load balancing, all of the rest of the application suite and the distributed cache unaffected. This is a drop in transparent change. No performance degradation, no observable changes in, in behavior inside and out, and nothing breaks that we can see. And for the details about why this works, I will point you to the paper. There is one observable difference, however. So there is this notion of when there's a new name, you want to map it to an IP address. A priori provisioning, however, for that IP address or name is rather difficult. And what ends up happening is you get something like this, a very large skew when you look at load per IP address. So on the left, this is the requests per IP. And on the right y-axis, this is the bytes per IP. And what you can see is many orders of magnitude difference bef uh, before we dropped in our, our changes. Afterwards, when we randomized on a slash 20, so this is 4,000 addresses, this was reduced to but an order of magnitude or two. Later, when we reduced the randomization pool to 256 addresses, barely a fraction of a magnitude for either measure. And so what I can say confidently is randomization breaks nothing, but it can expose weaknesses in system design where those designs rely on IP addresses or associate any meaning to an IP address. Now, if randomization works over a whole bunch of addresses, then why not randomize over a single address, effectively reducing the address pool to one? Turns out this works really well. In fact, it might be preferable because anything that could be broken by randomization, or at least reveals weaknesses in systems design, is unbroken by the use of one address. In addition, connection coalescing comes out for free. And just again, to give some confidence, this test was originally scheduled for three days, and it's now since been three months we've left it running. So let's come back to that summary in the observables and talk a little bit about the future. When it comes to names to IP addresses, we see virtually no limit. We can change the addresses as fast as we might choose to, and we can change them for any reason that we might choose. And two questions emerge as a result. What new systems does this enable? I refer you to the paper for a description of some of the things that we're thinking about, which include route leak detection and mitigation for any cast, denial of service protections, and really, really fantastic measurements. One open question, however, is how best to express those addressing policies. This is one I would love to put to the community, and if anyone is interested in discussing it, please, by all means, get in touch. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great talk. Um, I see at least one question on the Slack. It's from Piyush Kumar Sharma. The question goes like this. How does your approach of dynamic IP compare to current techniques such as dynamic NAT or PAT? Port PAT is port address translation. So the um, if I've understood the, the question correctly, all things NAT are, are effectively on the client side. So the focus of this is on the server side, on the connection termination side. We, we could argue whether it's, it's uh, similar on both sides, um, the meaning of it. Certainly it appears to be similar. So if you're doing, let's say you're behind a carrier grade NAT, for everyone, every connection you make, there might be a brand new IP address. And so from that perspective, I suppose, if I'm doing a randomization, any domain or host name will eventually appear on every one of the addresses in this. This part is true. I see. Okay, um, let me see if there's any other question. I had one of, I had one question as well. Just give me one minute. Yeah, so with a single IP address, how are packets routed to the correct server once it, once the packet has entered the Yes, of the CDN. Right. So this is this is the fantastic thing about relying on prior and existing technology. Um, the great work with respect to ECMP and consistent hashing. So it's the consistent hashing that takes the four tuple and ensures that when a packet comes in, 
once it's been, uh, after the first packet gets routed to the, to the appropriate server within the network, every subsequent packet with the same four tuple will end up landing on the same server. So this is actually handled externally, not by this system, um, with layer four load balancers. Okay, thank you so much. Um, there are no more questions, but I encourage everyone to post questions on the Slack channel. And with that, we are going to move to the fourth and final presentation. It's called AnyOpt. Again, it's about AnyCast. So the title is AnyOpt, predicting and optimizing IP AnyCast performance. And our presentation presenter is going to be Xiao Sheng. I hope I'm pronouncing it correct. Uh, he's a PhD student at Duke University. He's advised by Professor Xiao Wei Yang and Professor Bruce Max. And his research interests are in IP AnyCast, network measurement, and anomaly detection. Um, let's move over to the video. Hello, everyone. My name is Xiao Zhang. Today, I'm going to introduce our work on predicting and optimizing the performance of IP and AnyCast networks. This is a joint work with my collaborators list on this slide. IP AnyCast is a routing mechanism that allows routers to announce the same IP prefix from multiple different locations. In this talk, we refer to each location where the prefix is announced at an AnyCast site. For example, in this figure, I show three AnyCast sites. Typically, each site has an on-site router and servers that receive client traffic. Suppose they all announce the same IP prefix based on the BGP routing policy. Different client traffic designated to the AnyCast prefix may reach different sites. We refer to the site of client that reach a site as the site's catchment. Today, AnyCast is used by many geographically located services, such as DNS root name servers, content distribution networks, and DDoS mitigation services. In this work, we focus on minimizing a client latency to AnyCast site, which is important to any, uh, DNS and CDN. Ideally, we expect that clients will reach the closest AnyCast sites so as to minimize the latency between a client and the service. For example, in this picture, we deployed a service at three AnyCast sites, one in Chicago, one in London, and one in Singapore. Ideally, this is what we want the catchment to look like. Each client reaches its closest site, as shown by different dot colors dots. If the catchment follows this ideal distribution, the average client run to time to their catchment site will be only 62 milliseconds. However, this picture shows what the actual catchment look like. Clients do not necessarily reach their closest sites. Many clients in America and uh, Europe reach the site in Singapore. The average client round trip time to any custom site reach 133 in this case which is more than twice as the ideal case. To deploy an AnyCast service, a service provider needs to choose AnyCast sites to announce the AnyCast prefix. A key challenge here is that mapping between client networks and the AnyCast sites are determined by BGP policy-based routing decisions rather than the service provider's goals, such as minimizing latency and balancing the workload. In fact, several measurement studies have revealed that some AnyCast catchment exhibit unexpectedly inflated latency and increasing the number of AnyCast sites in a deployment counterintuitively increase average latency for clients. The crucial question we want to answer in this work is giving a site of potential AnyCast sites, how to choose an AnyCast subsite among them to minimize the average client latency. In order to do that, we must first be able to predict the catchment and estimate the latency. To, in order to minimize average client latency, we can do this by a straw mile approach. In the straw mile approach, we will announce all configurations that cover all possible combinations with the available sites. Then for each announced configuration, we will measure its catchment and average client latency. In the end, we will choose the configuration with the minimal client latency. However, the problem of the straw mile approach is that the number of experiments is exponential in the number of any kind of sites. In our work, we took a principled measure, model, and optimized uh, approach to solve this problem with con without conducting exponential number of experiments. First, we measure a client's preferences between each pair of AnyCast sites. Then we model a client's route selection behavior as a linear preference order with a pairwise comparison result. 
In the end, we solve an optimization problem offline to minimize the latency. Fortunately, in the early stage of this work, we tried the Stroman approach on small test bed. As observed that, a great number of clients form a linear preference order among the available Anika sites. For example, in this figure, the client has three Anika sites and it prefers site A over site B and over site C. And then if a prefix is announced from any subset of the potential sites, the client will always select the most preferred one. That is, if the Anika's prefix is announced from only site A and site C, the client selects site A. Similarly, if the Anika prefix is announced from site B and site C, the client selects site B. If the Anika's prefix is announced from all sites, the client selects site A. Motivated by this observation, we hypothesis that a client will form a linear order among available Anika sites, and we can predict its catchment based on this linear order. How can we discover the linear order of all clients? We design an approach that use pairwise comparison experiments to discover all clients' linear preferences. In this pairwise preference comparison, we'll select two Anika sites among available ones and announce our prefix to both of them from the central control server, which is referred as to orchestrator in our work. After the BGP system got converged, we'll send out the pin request packet to the pin targets to discover their preferences. When the client receives the pin request, the client will reply pin response and the response will be returned based on the uh, client's current catchment. In this case, the response from X uh, will come to the orchestrator once tunnel between site A and the orchestrator. Then we know for client X, it prefer site A or site B. Similarly, we can extract the preferences of our client, other clients. Both client Y and Z will prefer site B or site A. With this pairwise comparison method, we can reduce the number of experiments that are needed to get enough information to predict catchment to quadratic in the number of potential sites. In order to evaluate the existence of a linear order, we build a model test bed. In this map, we showed the footprint of our test bed. We have 15 Anika sites around the world considering both traffic concentration and also geographical coverage. Each site has one trend provider and various other peering links. We also deployed one server in Europe to control the Anika's configuration and measure the round trip times and the preference orders, which is called the orchestrator. The server build up tunnel with each of the site and peer with them uh, and send out all the measurement packages through the tunnel. We also includes, uh, include a pin target site that contains more than 15,300 different router IP addresses. The site comes from more than uh, 12,000 slash 24 different network prefixes, and it covers more than 5,300 different ASs, and each target is representative of one or more client networks. From the pairwise comparison experiment, we can obtain all clients' preference orders. For example, in this figure, after the experiments, we can obtain the preference order of client X, Y, and Z. Then we can also measure the round trip time of each client to each Anika site, as shown in this figure. The preference order and the round trip time measurements are the input to our all optimization problem, which is minimizing the average client latency based on clients' round preference orders. It turned out this problem is exactly the simple facility location problem with the client's preference orders, which is an NP-hard problem and has no polynomial approximation solution. I have mentioned that we assume that a client has a linear order uh, among all Anika sites. Does this assumption hold in practice? In this paper, we proved two scenarios that client will have a linear order. In the first scenario, if the route selection of all BGP router is strictly based on the preference orders among neighbors, then each client will have a linear order among available sites. In the second scenario, if the Anika prefix is announced from only tier one transit providers, and the route selection of all BGP routers is based on AS path and the neighbor ID, then each client will have a linear order among available sites. Both of these scenarios are consistent with valley free routing model. And it is also indicated that a linear order may, always, may not always exist under generic BGP routing policy. Despite our proof, we found that a client may not always have has a linear order uh, under scenarios stated in the previous slide. After careful investigation, we found that 
This was caused by a BGP implementation issue. The left side lists several factors in sequence described in the BGP RFC specification. Those factors are used in the type breaking on the BGP routers. Different from the RFC specification, the real implementation of the major network device manufacturers usually has have one more factors between interior cost and the router ID, and that is the router's the routes arrival time. In order to account for the arrival time, in each pairwise comparison, we announce the prefix from the two sites in two different orders. After resolving the arrival order, the ratio of clients that has, have a linear order increased significantly. As shown in this graph, the x-axis shows the number of any kind of sites that, has, uh, that we include in the pairwise comparison, and the y-axis shows the fraction of clients that exhibit a consistent linear order with the pairwise comparison result. When we resolve the uh, arrival order, the fraction is nearly 90%, even for 15 sites. But if we only count for uh, to uh, if we only announce to both sites simultaneously, the fraction is just 15%. After we discover each client's linear order, we can estimate the round trip time for one specification, one specific any cast configuration with the predicted catchment. In this graph, we show the CDF or absolute estimation error. We deploy 38 random configuration that compose with one to 14 different sites. After we deploy them, we measure the actual round trip time and compare it with the predicted round trip time according to a client's linear preference order. As we can see here, nearly 90% of all uh, estimation, the absolute estimation error is less than 8 milliseconds. Because any optic can estimate the round trip time for different uh, any cost configuration with just small error, we can search for the optimi uh, optimal configuration offline. This graph shows shows the round trip time of different NCAS configurations. Any of opt its optimal configuration found in the offline, offline optimization. It only includes 12 different sites. As a comparison, we also select the top 12 sites with the smallest unicast average round trip time, which is denoted by 12 greedy. Any opt can achieve 32 millisecond median round trip time reduction with the same number of sites. We also compare it with the 15 all configuration, which means we, all, we announced the Anycast prefix from all 15 available Anycast sites. Compared with the 15 opt, any opt can still achieve 14 millisecond median round trip time reduction even with three laser sites. To summarize, in this work, we made the following contributions. First, we observe and formulate the hypothesis that the client site preference form a linear order. And we prove that under limited conditions, the hypothesis holds in practice then we designed any opt for any cost catchment prediction and performance optimization. Finally, we evaluated its performance using a real-world test bed and showed that it can accurately predict any cost catchment and minimize the average client latency. Okay, very good. That was a great talk. Let's see if there are any questions. I don't see anything on the Slack channel just yet. So I have one of my questions. Uh, you made some assumptions about how the global PGP routing system works, specifically the valley free property. Do you have a sense of how their violations might impact accuracy of any of yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So uh, we found that in the actual network, there are many issues that can influence the total order that we discovered in our experiment. Uh, but in the end, we found it's it just a very small portion. So it's just nearly like uh, no more than 10% 10, 10 of all the pinpoints that will not have the linear order in the end. So in our paper, uh, for those clients that we could not make a precise uh, prediction, we just leave that them out. I see. Okay, uh, we do have one question on Slack uh, from Romain Jacob. His question is, do you see any reason the linear preferences may change at other time or I guess over time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's also a very good question. So uh, because like, uh, it's like a chasing a dynamic object to, to measure the internet. All the things can, ch can change with the time. So 
we did find several uh, reasons that can influence the, the, the linear order of the clients. So the, like for example, sometimes the, uh, the agreement between different ISP can change and some sites can change to another like transit provider. So in this case, the, uh, in this case, the linear order can change. So that also means we need to use that updated model or take, take the like time elapsed into the consideration when adopting this method. Nice. Um, another question on the Slack channel from Ethan Katz Bassett. Uh, Neat work, the paper has a result on how the percentage of clients with a total order decreases when you go up to 15 sites. Do you have an understanding that would let you predict or understand how it changes as you increase the number of providers much more? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's also a very good question. So, yeah. The, so, because of the limitation of our test bed so far, we only involve like 15 sites globally, and we only involve like six different transit providers. So, so far we found out that with uh, the, the, yeah, uh, so far we, we found that with six transit provider, uh, the six specific transit provider, it can work very well, even though like the same sites in, within the same AS can increase, the total order can be largely guaranteed. But when we increase the number of tier one transit provider, the, uh, the ratio may decrease in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, probably last question. This is a follow up from Romain. Is there a way you could detect that the preferences may have changed, maybe based on RTTs? Uh, naturally, I mean detect it without or before redoing the experiment to measure them? Yeah, yeah, that's also a very good question. So, yeah, so one big issue for the like linear order is the up updated linear order may happen in the future. So uh, round trip time can be a very great way to measure the change when you detect a like, change point for the same client along a long time. That potentially can be due to a past change and also the catchment can change. Yeah, so that's a very great suggestion. So I think maybe the trace route is also another alternative way to can do this. Okay, thank you. And that brings us to the end of this session. We started and ended with any cast related talks and in between we talked about videos and very essence of what it means to be an IP address. Um, I thought it was a great session. I hope all of you enjoyed it. Um, I would like to thank all the speakers and everyone who joined this session. And with that, um, this concludes the session. And I think the next session is in another 15, 20 minutes, I suppose. Thank you so much. Bye.